Hi, welcome to AP Daily Practice Sessions for AP Physics 2. I'm Holly Mosley and I teach at Liberty High School in Frisco, Texas. In this video, we're going to look at some strategies for the experimental design question, but many of these strategies are going to serve you well across the whole free response portion of your exam. Before we get started, if you want to follow along, be sure and download the PDF to follow along. I am going to let you in on a little secret to this exam. You can't get the score that you really, really want just by knowing physics. You have to communicate that knowledge to others. So as we're working through this first free response question, make sure you keep that in mind. Be looking for ways for you to communicate what you know and that you understand physics instead of just trying to get to an answer. So with that in mind, let's get going. Okay, so in this question, we have a group of students that is investigating the properties of a concave mirror. So the picture shows a concave mirror, its focal point F and its center of curvature C. And then that arrow represents our object. And we're asked to draw a ray diagram that's gonna illustrate the formation of the image that includes at least two rays and the resulting image. So let's do it. First of all, a ray that travels parallel to the principal axis always reflects back through the focus. Therefore, kind of the opposite of that or the opposite of that, a ray that travels towards the mirror passing through the focus is gonna reflect off the mirror parallel to the principal axis. Because the intersection of the two incident rays was at the tip of the object, the intersection of the two reflected rays, therefore, is at the tip of the image. So our image forms right there. So let's look at how we would get points on this part. The first point is awarded just for drawing one correct ray that reflects off the mirror. The second point, you got to do a little bit more. You got to draw a second ray and no incorrect rays. So we did that. That's our purple one. So we would get that point. And then lastly, to get the final point, we need to draw the image at the intersection of the reflected rays, which we did. So we would get that point. So we've kind of got a little setup. Now we're going to get into the experimental design part. So these students want to collect data that can be graphed to determine how the magnification depends on the object distance. They have a mirror, they have a light bulb, they have a screen, and they have some other common physics equipment. So part B is going to ask us to design a procedure that could be used to collect the appropriate data. If we look at this, this first subpart is asking us to fill in a table about what quantities are we going to measure, what are we going to call them, what tools are we going to use. Okay, but before we answer part I, let's go on to the next part and just get a preview of it. Okay, again, remember we want magnification and object distance. The next part is gonna ask us to describe the procedure that we would use. So we need to give enough detail that somebody else, another student could follow our experiment and we're gonna use our symbols that we come up with in the first part. Before we even write the procedure, let's finish reading part B. In this last part, B, triple I, we're asked to describe how we would calculate the values of the magnification based on what we measure. Okay, so if you think about this experimental design question, these parts were presented in the order that we might actually tell somebody who's going to repeat our experiment what to do. Hey, you need to grab this equipment, you need to set it up this way and take these measurements so that you can do this data. But we're designing the lab, so we need to kind of work backwards and work with the end in mind. So I'm actually going to start with this part, this last part of part B, to figure out what data do we actually need, then I can design a procedure. So I'm going to start with an equation off of our equation sheet for magnification, because that's one of the things we wanted. So magnification is the ratio of image height to object height or image distance to object distance. And we just use absolute values for those. So if I look at this, I now know magnification can be determined by calculating the ratio of the image distance to the object distance. So image distance and object distance will give me magnification. So I'll have magnification, and then of course I'll have object distance. That was my prompt. I wanted to know the relationship or how magnification depends on object distance. Okay, so this would give us the one point for describing how to calculate the magnification from the object and, and image heights or object and image distances. And we just have to make sure that when we do this, we're consistent with the procedure that we write. So now we're gonna circle back. We just figured out that we need object distance or distance from object to mirror. So let's call that SO because that's what our equation sheet uses. And we can measure that with a meter stick or a ruler. And then we figured out that we need distance from image to mirror. Let's call that SI. And again, we can do that with a meter stick. 
So that would get us the one point for listing the appropriate combination of quantities that we would need. So examples for that are the object and image distance. That's what we did. You can also do this if you use object distance, object height, and image height. That's another way. It's just not the way we approached it. Okay, so we have figured out what data we need, and now we're going to tell somebody how to get that data. So we're going to describe that procedure. So I'm going to start by placing the bulb, which is my object, and the screen on the same side of the mirror, because it's a mirror. It's reflective. That image is going to form on the same side of the mirror as the object. I know that I need to measure the distance between the object and the mirror. And then I know that in order to get accurate image distance, I need the image to be in focus. So I'm going to adjust that screen until I get a nice, sharp, crisp image of that light bulb on that screen. And once I find that, then I can measure the image distance from the mirror to the screen. So that's how we could get SO and SI, object distance and image distance. But we're trying to find a relationship between magnification and object distance. That's just one value. I need a relationship. I need lots of data. So the last thing that I need to do is make sure that I move the light bulb to a whole bunch of locations and repeat those measurements again so that I get a wide data set. And the bigger range I do, the more I can trust my data. So to get these points, we would get one point for manipulating the distance between the mirror and the screen to make sure that our image is in focus. That's what we did in step three. And then we would also get a point for collecting multiple data points for multiple object positions. So that's not just the same measurement over and over. It's moving it around and getting lots of data. That's what we did in step two and four was where we got the data and five is where we said we were going to repeat it. All right. In part C, we're now given a figure that shows the students calculated values for the absolute value of magnification as a function of their measured object distances. First thing they ask us to do is draw a line or a curve that best represents that data. Well, it doesn't look like a line to me, so it must be a curve. And it kind of looks like it's got a horizontal and a vertical asymptote. Then we're asked to describe the effect that increasing the object distance has on the magnification according to the graph. Okay, this is just interpreting data from the graph. No slope calculation, nothing crazy here. We can just look at this and we can see that as the distance between the object and the mirror increases, the magnification decreases. That's what that graph is showing me. Okay, so to earn the points in this part, I would get my one point for drawing a nice smooth curve that generally follows the trend in the data. So I did that. And then I would get a point for indicating that the as the object distance increases, the magnification decreases. So I did that. So I would get those points. In the final part, in part D, we're asked to derive an expression for the absolute value of the magnification in terms of the object distance and the focal length of the mirror. In AP Physics, derive has a really, really specific meaning. It means start with something that's always true, not just true in this one specific situation. So I want to look for a very broad kind of fundamental principle to start. So let's start there. It's always true that for a spherical mirror, the absolute value of the magnification is equal to the image distance over the object distance and the absolute value of that quantity. So, but I'm actually supposed to find magnification in terms of object distance. So I've got both of those things in this expression, but I'm also supposed to find it in terms of the focal length. And I don't have focal length in here. I have image distance. So I'm not done. And that's the point of this derive. So now I can bring in another physics principle and I know the mirror equation, one over the object distance plus one over the image distance equals one over the focal length. And that's going to allow me to relate image distance and focal length so that I can replace image distance with something else in that magnification equation. So I'm going to take this and I'm just going to do some algebra right now. It's not really physics, it's algebra, um, but it's a tool for physics. I'm going to solve this equation for SI. So I've isolated one over SI. I found a common denominator. And lastly, I've solved for SI, focal length times SO over SO minus F. So now I have an expression that I can go in and plug in for SI in my original equation. So I'm going to make that substitution right here for SI. And then I am going to just algebraically simplify it. And now I have an expression for the magnification in terms of the object distance and the focal length. So to get my points, 
This actually was just one point, but it was the one point for combining the expression for the magnification in terms of the object distance and the image distances, which is what I did. I will say a lot of times a derive is more than just one point, but in this case, it was just one point. So in the final subpart, we're asked to use the graph to determine the focal length of the mirror, and then we need to support our answer by citing either relevant physics principles or showing calculations. So we have our graph from earlier that I've brought over, and we also have the equation that we just derived in the previous part. So if I look at this function, I see that as SO, or the object distance, approaches F, the focal length, the denominator of that expression is going to approach zero, which means that the magnification is going to approach infinity. So if I look at the graph, that magnification looks like it's approaching infinity. That's that vertical asymptote right there at about 20 centimeters. So mathematically, this shows me that the focal length of this mirror is about 20 centimeters. Again, it says we could also cite relevant physics principles. So our other approach is we could say that we know, hey, no images are formed when an object is at the focal point of a converging mirror, because that's when the rays, the reflected rays are parallel. So that's why our graph is never going to show a magnification value at 20 centimeters. We see it approaching an infinite magnification when the object is 20 centimeters. So Either way we do this, we would get these points because we've described how magnification asymptotically approaches infinity, that's that vertical asymptote, as the object distance approaches the focal length. So we did that. And then we get one point for using the graph to show that that happens when we are right there at 20 centimeters. Thanks for joining me to work through an experimental design question. You are almost to the finish line. Keep practicing and I'll see you soon.